There we go. So this is a pick Jerry's brain call around the idea of lime coats, uh, which we'll dive into in just a second. And one way to think about it is that we had a really nice dinner conversation recently where you broached the idea. This is kind of a continuation of that. And I'm a little bit more informed than I might be in a typical pick Jerry's brain session because I had a bunch of ideas during our conversation that I came back and loaded up in my brain. Uh, and then I will, um, what, what I'm trying to do in the session is make your idea be all that it could be, a little bit like the Army's old motto, except <laughs> in fact, which is almost a little bit apropos to this conversation, uh, right? Because uh, yeah. it's a service force of some sort that's going around the world, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm, uh, here's my calendar, but here's your post on your blog about Lime Coats. So I, I've got that. And then here's my... Uh, brain, oops, and I'm actually not sharing screen yet. So I think it would probably help a lot if I did that and then showed you your post on Lime Coats, which is right here. Yep. And then also here's my brain. This is the thought I've created for this call. Um, so I've started out with a bunch of things and we can dive in or we can just hit pause for a second and see uh, what questions, what other questions you have as we go in. Yeah, so... Um... Uh, if if I, I I love history, um, so if if I may be permitted a little bit of history, which maybe we covered, um, very likely we did, Jerry, when we uh, were talking at dinner, um, which is once upon a time, <laughs> um, Jonathan and I were having dim sum in San Francisco, and Jonathan remembers where, right? Yang Sing, remember? Yang Sing, of course. Of course. Um, I mean, there are other yeah. places, but really. But why? Why would you go there? But why? <laughs> but why bother? <laughs> so, and as and as I recall it, um, you know, I was opining as I sometimes do on on the thing, the the, the legacy I wanted to leave uh, uh, as a result of my American presidency, um, which was to create a mandatory national service. Right. Uh, and. Uh, Jonathan, probably without missing a beat, said, oh, I should really tell you uh, about this story um, that I made up once upon a time. And he told me for the first time about um, a story he had, he had written, which at the time uh, referred to uh, a group called Yellow Jackets, which, uh, which have since become line coats. And uh, Jonathan can speak to why. Sting. There you go. <laughs> um, but... Um, but 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 at the time, you know, uh, the conversation was very much uh, a connection around um, uh, how people might um, become part of a constructive, positive, uh, progressive uh, force, um, rather than a dominating, colonializing, uh, et cetera, um, force. Um, and Jonathan and I have talked, you know, on and off about uh, these ideas for years, um, and you know uh, what 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 we might ever make of them. Um, in the past couple of years, um, you know, I, I shared uh, some of this thinking with a friend who you know got super excited about it, and yet again said, "Hey, you know, like we got to do something uh, with these ideas. They're too too good." And in the past couple of years, in particular. It, it started to seem to me that the Lime Coats design fiction, among other things, provided a kind of powerful uh, uh, and, and catalytic way in to uh, talking about um, policing, um, you know, which we can see has also, you know, like, like the military that was sort of the original uh, subject uh, 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 as the archetypal corrupt institution um, in the original line coats fiction um, is a thing with a lot of the same kind of problems, right? Uh, because surprise, surprise, you know, the systemic antecedents are largely the same. Um, and uh, in some cases, in some cases, police perhaps worse. Um, you know, than, uh, than the history of, of the armed forces. But anyway, just wanted to sort of lay that historical table setting. Did I get that mostly right, Jonathan, from, from your recollections? At least yeah, the, our... the, other, the other piece of it too is the way in which, um, you know, we actually ask 
the armed forces to do a bunch of things that aren't soldiering, right? No. Because no. they're the institution we have available. So, and, and there's this, you know, sort of scramble to find resources whenever there is um, either a uh, urgent or an ongoing need for some kind of supportive intervention. Like, you know, if, if there's a, um, you know, if there's a hurricane and people are washed out of their homes, then we kind of weirdly send the Marines to help. And there are things like the International Red Cross, but what we really need is some, you know, sort of standing capacity to hand, field those kinds of things. And then there's also the kinds of crazy things that like the US Army Corps of Engineers is doing all over the world, mm -hmm. um, addressing these kind of more strategic infrastructural problems. And again, it is kind of weird to have that in the form of the armed forces. And then on the third hand, there's also the example of the Peace Corps, um, which is a parallel idea, but the Peace Corps is um, a deliberately kind of anarchic, um, um, deliberately amateurist um, institution as compared to this other thing that we need. And not that the Peace Corps is bad, but um, we also need something that's like professionalized that like has, um, the sort of tidy can-do effectiveness that we associate with you know military institutions at their best yeah, yeah. um and and maybe you know um because i'm sure that i've heard this at some point but but not recently um what do you what do you remember about what uh, what actually put put all of this in your mind once upon a time, I, was there an occasioning event or context that, that started you thinking down this path once upon a time? Oh, yeah. No, I, I can tell you exactly what it was. In um, So there's a science fiction writer named David Gerald who um, wrote a, a series of novels called The War Against the Couture. with flying saucers and ray guns, they invade with invasive species, space kudzu, and, um, and sort of like uh, disconcertingly, it actually starts with a series of plagues, kills off a lot of the human population. And then as people are picking up the pieces, they're dealing with all of these problems. And um, part of the science fictional conceit is that um, prior to the events of the novels, the United States has suffered a catastrophic military debacle in debacle failure, um, <laughs> um, such that the world community said, we are sick and tired of your uh, imperial uh, military adventurism. They forced the US to disarm and repurposed the US military to be a global force for running around and fixing all the things that uh, imperialism and colonialism broke. This is the war against the Couture? Yep. Thanks. Um, yeah, uh, George R. R. Martin's fans don't know pain. I know pain. Uh, because <laughs> the fourth book came out 25 years ago and it's a seven part series. And like, <laughs> where, where's the next one? Dave, where, where is it? Um, so, so I, I read this um, when I was, I read the first, no, the first novel, like when I was a teenager and, um, and it, it's in dialogue with the sort of para-fascist ideas of military service in, um, in Heinlein's novel, Starship Troopers. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, like, it's very directly in dialogue with that. Like, it, it, it's, it's clear, there's, there are scenes where it's like, yeah, let's do this, but not fascist. And, um, and I, that just sort of stuck in my mind. And, um, and that led to the design fiction that was rattling around in my head that um, bubbled up when we had that conversation. It must have been, what, uh, six or seven years ago now. Yeah, I mean, it may be longer, Jonathan. It may be, it may be more like 10, but... Um, yeah, we're old. Yeah. It's hard to keep track of time. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. It is. Um, yeah, so, so that's all good. Um, that's all good uh, history. Um, and I'm uh, enjoying looking, uh, looking at the uh, And I'm happy to wonder wherever I'm, whatever I'm passing that 
it attracts your attention. If you see a shiny object, tell me about it and I'll go there. <clears throat> um, I have a bunch of stuff about the US Marine Corps. And, and there's also um, actually reforming the police is a, a thought that I have that is connected to abolish the police, which goes back to sort of the Black Lives Matter right. and everything else that was going on. <clears throat> and, and I'll just do a little sort of quick tour here because we have police doing things that they have no business doing. We, we've kind of right. gotten rid of a whole series of preventative measures and social services, both, which is like mostly snipped them, cut them, shredded them. And then that means that everything shows up either in the ER or the police have to you know, come in uh, and intervene. And so, so this conversation is stalled, stuck, broken in the US. Uh, Abolish the police is probably the worst branding there's ever been for an interesting movement. Um, it's right up there with nonviolent communication, which is a fabulous way of doing things and a really, really bad name. Because um, all you think about is like, wait, there's violence in that word. There's, well, how'd that happen? <laughs> but but, but there's, the, uh, there's this very nice starting notion that militaries, whether police or armies, are the wrong people to be fixing stuff, right? Uh, and in Portland, for example, they created a street service corps whose name escapes me right now. But the PPD, the Portland Police Department, which got itself in lots and lots of trouble during lockdown and all of the protests, um, they, they spun off this group that gets sent to street incidents. And it, it, it's got like an EMT and a psychiatrist and you know several different kinds of people who can show up and actually deal with things that aren't police matters. And, and part of the problem also is that um, police matters sometimes escalate way out of control. And part of the uh, problem there is that we militarized our police. Um, and there's a, uh, I'm going to follow this, this just a little bit further because this is kind of a, this is a, uh, an interesting thing that is connected, but a lot of U.S., <clears throat> um, here's the militarization of police, and I'll connect that to our call today, and the Bulletproof Warrior, which is a training that most of our police forces have had in the U.S., and it started from uh, this guy, uh, oops, uh, Dave Grossman, who I used to like, I've never met him, but he wrote a really, really, really interesting book called On Killing, The Psychological Cost of Learning oh, to yeah. War in yeah, Society. Yeah, yeah. It's a brilliant yep. book. And yep. I used to use this because the psychology of killing talks about, um, I used to use this about marketing and advertising. I used to say yep. that, hey, because advertisers live fancy lives on Madison Avenue and elsewhere and have social distance and psychological distance from the people they're dropping messages on, they don't worry about it. But in fact, it's, you know, there's a lot of lessons for advertising in this book. So yep. it turns out that his next, uh, his next gig was inventing the Bulletproof Warrior and going and training a bunch of police to pull the trigger and empty their clip when it seems like their own lives are barely in jeopardy. It's like, it's either your mm. life or theirs, so empty your clip. And this is, this is part of the freak out is that our police have avoided this thing that was invented a very long time ago which is called the Peel Principles or the Peelian Principles, named after Sir Robert Peel, who was a prime minister of the UK way back when and helped create the Metropolitan Police in 1829. And the Peel Principles for an ethical police force are lovely and they're part of the reason why Bobbies walked around without weapons, mm -hmm. right? And then there's a counter argument here, which is like, yeah, except now you have gangs with submachine guns, et cetera, et cetera. That's an interesting conversation. And at that point, I've gone too many like tangents from the place where we're starting. But, but an important question is, for example, how do you keep lime coats safe? Well, like, and I think the cool answer, which no one will like. Oh, good. Perfect. <laughs> perfect. Is that you don't. Hmm. You don't keep them safe. Yeah. You don't keep them safe. What you do is you build a cultural myth of heroism around that fact, just as we do with firefighters and just as we do with soldiers, right? You yeah, recognize I, I, that it's dangerous yeah. and you honor the danger and you make the commitment to, um, to you know, not just nonviolence, but like anti-violence of the Lime Code ethos to be part of what you romanticize. Like the, the whole point of the design fiction is to say, like, how do you build the poetics of this such that it produces the cultural values that you want in such an institution? Because, you know, on the, on the global scale, 
right? The, the danger here, the thing that makes me nervous about my own proposal is the inherent white saviorism, colonial, imperialist, we know what to do. We're gonna send a bunch of guys in uniform. Like the poetics of that and the actual mechanics of that are both a serious, serious problem if you're actually going to do any of these things. And I think, you know, like, again, on the global scale, the United States actually has a moral responsibility having run around and broken a bunch of things like, you know, ha and having, you know, siphoned off the world's wealth, well, then we should be devoting our energies to setting some things right. And there's a bunch of governance questions about that, but there's also the poetics. So like, I, I think at some point, I, I don't know if it's in the, in the blog post, um, like, if, you know, they need a Latin motto, which means something like, you know, fearless into danger. Um, like that's gotta be central to what the ethos is. And you yeah, need something awesome. like equivalent to the Hippocratic Oath, right? right? Where, where you know, you say, you know, we're going to help anyone and everyone, and if they're threatening us, well, then that's part of the job. And and yeah. it gets really interesting because if nobody invited you in, but you come rushing in because you're here to help, is that a problem? I mean, it certainly is. Yeah. So, I mean, this is, this, this is why, right. This is, this is why the conversation about, uh, ab about a bear, bear fiction is so, uh, both inviting and necessary. Right. So, um, I, I'm going to agree with, with Jonathan in spirit, but, but disagree, um, for example, on, on, on the idea of, um, uh, like, you know, your question was, how do, how do we keep them safe? And, and, and Jonathan said, we don't, by which he meant, if I'm not wrong, Jonathan, we, we, we don't, we are going to put them in danger. Uh, I mean, their, their very mission is, is to be willing to, to place themselves in a certain kind of danger, uh, which is not to say jeopardy, uh, right? But, but, but the, the contexts in which line coats present themselves are per se dangerous. That's not only unavoidable, it's the nature of the context into which you want to introduce them in the first place. So the question you know, of, of keeping them safe um, is secondary to me to the, the, the other, you know, what I think is a really interesting question in a contrast to you know, your, your thing about the militarization of the police, um, Jerry, is so, so we need to talk a little bit more about context uh, and, and the sort of uh, uh, summoning occasions and contexts that would bring, bring forth line codes. And for me, then the question is, how do we equip line, line codes? Right. Right. Um, and, 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 you know, the first order answer, which is in the very name uh, that, that, that Jonathan has given so far, is part of their equipment is how they literally show up. Um, and, and there's something, you know, very, very, um, intentional, um, about the idea of how they show up bright and visible. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and, and I think, you know, um, one of the, one of the things that certainly, uh, I'm interested in poking at, um, you know, when we use lime coats as a way into talking about policing, for example, is, you know, um, in order to talk about policing, you know, we don't have to accept all of the terms of the conversation that are already set up by policing, right? We can use it as a way into talking beyond the, the current reality uh, that, that we confront and don't like. Um, and, and I guess, you know, part of that for me is, um, you know, this, this contextual question. What is it that summons line codes? And one of the things that Jonathan and I had a little conversation about, but you know, certainly an area that I'm really interested in digging into more deeply is the idea that one of the things that line codes can do is witness. Um, and, and so there's a question mark about whether, you know, um, like police, line codes should um, show up to intervene whatever that means, right? Uh, because uh, that's one of the things that for sure is true about police, right? Is police uh, are dispatched, at least propositionally prepared 
to intervene. Um, and that's not a necessary step. Uh, but if not exactly intervention, then what? Um, so I, I just think that's really fertile uh, space. Um, it's, it's super fertile space and uh, several things occur immediately. Uh, one is this notion of, and uh, well, fair witnesses from Heinlein, which is people who are in white robes, hello. <laughs> uh, so this might actually sort of be role models for lion coats. Let's connect yeah, that. That's a charming idea because um, like part of the poetics of fair witnesses is that they have this whole mystique about their um, fundamental ethical commitment, which is part of how they define themselves. And, and that's very much the kind of thing that I think is useful in the design fiction for lime coats as well. Yes. Exactly. And fair witnesses are uh, in, a, in a court of law, will, like you can fully trust what a fair witness says because that is their pledge, that is how they're raised, et cetera, et cetera. So, so there's kind of that. Then there's a whole other sort of witnessing thing uh, about enlightened witnesses which it comes out of Alice Miller in her book, Banished Knowledge. And an enlightened witness is basically someone who will listen to your story and believe you and doesn't need to solve anything or fix anything. And, and mm. an early girlfriend kind of enlightened me on this because she was a big fan of Alice Miller, introduced me to her thinking. <clears throat> and I was like, like, like a guy, I'd hear something and be like, oh, oh. And, you know, and, and at one point she's like, you don't need to fix this. I just want you to hear it. Right? right, and and there's a piece of the crises that we're in, which is we are in uh, an epidemic of not listening. Yeah. So that's I've got a bunch of stuff around that, which I'll connect up to our thought. Oh, and and, and sorry, you know, I gotta I, I gotta stop you right there because Please. because you know um, there are so many um, uh, examples, but the first one that came to mind was Sandra Bland mm -hmm. um, of police violence that is literally about not listening. Bingo. Right? I mean, you can hear the not listening, <laughs> listening to the recording of the interaction between the cop who stopped Sandra Bland and Sandra Bland herself. Um, and, um, and, you know, so, so there, there are a <laughs> couple of things, right? I mean, um, uh, you know, there's not listening. Um, and there's the impossibility of listening or hearing created by certain circumstances, right? Some of them structural, some of them circumstantial, right? Um, but we have taught people, um, all people, not just white people, uh, to fear black men. Um, and that in certain contexts, I mean, the last thing you can afford to do is listen, and that goes to your allusion earlier, Jerry, to this whole, you know, empty the clip kind of idea, which, which clearly, like, I mean, like it's monstrous to to talk about it, but right, you know, one has to be able to imagine a context in which that was not introduced as a monstrous idea, but as a reasonable idea, right? Right. right. Um, it's either you or them. What has to, what has to be believed about the circumstance? And the threat such that that could even show up as a reasonable rather than a monstrous excessive out of the box idea um and i i do think that you know i do think it's very very connected to this uh uh idea of you know we make a joke right uh about you know a hard joke these days about shoot shoot first ask questions later right right but this is is a very real, uh, again, to the couple of points already made, this is not just uh, uh, a joke, it's actually a tactical posture, right? Exactly, um, exactly. And it, and it could be that one of the major weapons that Lyme coats are armed with is a very deep empathic listening, a patient listening. Um, here I'll point to Daryl Davis, who is one of my heroes who I got to interview recently. Uh, he's the guy you've seen his, his probably his TED, his TED talk. Uh, what do you do when someone just doesn't like you? And he basically says, how can you hate me when you don't even know me? He has a garage full of KKK robes because he listened to KKK grand dragons and other celebrities with yeah, respect and patience. 
And eventually, over the course of two years, they invited him to their homes and he invited them to his home. And they eventually said, here, take my robe, I'm out. Right? That, that, that melting of fear is, is brilliant and a piece of our problem because a different way of looking at Lyme coats is there are emergencies everywhere. We need to find a, a volunteer cord that's gonna rush into danger, solve it, turn and go to the next one. And that is yeah. a way of thinking about this, right? It's, it's a little bit like the firemen in Fahrenheit 451 or something like that. Like, they, you know, we've got to, got to burn the books. Oops, no, sorry, put out the books. Ah, never mind. <laughs> um, but, 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 you know, th there's very different ways of configuring or even, even thinking about it. And, and it's funny here, I, I'm, I'm going to go for a moment to uh, uh, Zappos because Zappos has this crazy, crazy thing where they think that spending a long time on a service call is a great thing. So they give wow, they give awards to people who thought I had this in here somewhere, but I'll just attach this thought. They give awards to their reps who spent a whole long time fixing something because they know that that person whose problem was solved, even if it took a long time, is going to tell that story 20 times. Right. Yeah. So, there's, so there's something about slowing down and patience. Same thing goes with uh, deep canvassing right now. Uh, political parties are discovering, oh, my God, that instead of, got to spell it right, instead of, uh, instead of uh, dropping by, showing you an app, leaving you a brochure, saying vote for my candidate and leaving, if you actually spend 45 minutes asking questions, you can change the vote. Like, like the actual shift is, is me measurable and much larger than the usual, let's book the numbers kind of canvassing. All of which to say is that slow is fast. Uh, yeah, and and, and to, build, to build on that and connect it again to, to listening, Jerry, um, you know, it, one, of, one of the, to me, one of the most effective political movements that, um, that you know, still, still very live and, and still very much, you know, not, not, I think, studied enough in its, in its tactics um, is, is Black Lives Matter. And um, of course, of course, the very concept of the phrase Black Lives Matter acknowledges the thing that, you know, too many clumsy white people, you know, run, run in the room right after and say, all lives matter. Of course they do, right? Um, except we don't act that way. Uh, we don't act as if we've ever heard that the, the phrase, you know, all lives matter as inclusive of black lives. Um, and, and it's clearly, um, you know, a, a deep uh, part of the tactics, um, whether whether this was you know deeply thought out uh, or, or 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 you know uh, uh, realized as we go, how important the repetition of the phrase is, so that slowly <laughs> we all understand and all start to listen, mm -hmm. right? Um, because it seems to me that precisely the, 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 the effect the phrase is meant to have on those of us who are not black is to listen to what we are not used to hearing, right? Um, it is to teach us to listen to something that we have been ignoring as much as we think or would like to think that uh, that our, our concept of human rights and equal rights already includes this idea, um, you know. Uh, but how could that be true if all the things that keep happening to Black people keep happening to Black people? It just cannot. Uh, and it, this is where I have to confess that I am a uh, I myself am a radicalized uh, police abolitionist. I, I think that in order yep. to solve the problems we're talking about, you need to completely sever the relationship with the entire institution of, of policing in the US for all of the familiar reasons, right? And so if we are to take this design fiction to thinking about the challenges of the thing we are trying to do with policing, yep. then um, I don't think that the thing that we are talking about when we talk about Lyme coats replaces everything that we ask police to do. Mm. Um, 
It's but it replaces yep. most of it yeah. because as, as you were saying earlier, right? You know, if there's an immediate crisis in a city, then you right, you call 911 and they send one of three kinds of person, people. They, they send a firefighter with a hose. And actually our general purpose problem solving resource is firefighters, right? Yep. Most of what firefighters do is not putting out fires, but the extreme primacy of fighting fires creates certain limitations for what firefighters can be sent to do because they're you know, very uh, resource intensive resource to the community, right? So you can't send firefighters to all of the things, yep. right? So, so we got firefighters, we got ambulances full of paramedics, and then we got cops. And the general purpose person we send to handle a crisis is the cop, a person with a gun, which is, you know, patently absurd and creates all of the bad incentives we're talking about. And the actual proper things that we ask police to do, like we do in fact need homicide detectives, yep. right? That, that, that's a legitimate function. And, and in, you know, my abolitionist post-policing dreams, right? There are still homicide detectives. They're just completely separated from the legacy of policing as we have it. Um, so, yeah, so you have to sorry. think about like the whole of the system. Like we're displacing a lot of what we ask police to do. We're displacing a little bit of what we ask firefighters to do. And we're opening up a bunch of spaces of things that should have been done all along where we don't have a resource that's appropriate at all. And so we resort to these wrong resources. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, so, so, uh, I think for me, um, you know, to agree with, with the substance of, of nearly all that you said, Jonathan, I mean, I think for me, you know, part of what's exciting about, uh, lime coats as an idea and, and as a conversation is it makes possible, I think, what, what for many people is not currently possible, which is even to reckon with the very sentence, abolish the police, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and, and so part of our problem is that, you know, even those of us who are most uh, uh, in, in tune uh, and sympathetic to, if not an outright advocate of abolitionist ideas, like cannot imagine a world without police. Right. Um, and certainly we're not going to get there by simply uttering phrases like that, right? Yeah. I mean, like none of us are so naive. Um, uh, but, but on the other hand, we're certainly not going to get there if it is literally possible, impossible for most humans to imagine the state of affairs that we think is the desirable state of affairs, right? And, and of course, you know, as you just, as you just elegantly did, Jonathan, like um, the other part of, of the abolitionist, even just the abolitionist phrase, but, you know, uh, it, its intent, um, you know, needn't be a complete erasure of all of the things that we consider to be policing, because like a lot of ideas that we think are corrupt uh, and beyond corrupt, uh, corrosive and destructive and, and, and so on. Um, uh, it's not everything in those ideas or institutions that are corrupt and it's not nothing that is, 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 is worth preserving. Right. And so, but, but when, one has to, uh, you know, I, I, I am when, when, when thinking about these things recently, um, you know, um, I found myself, you know, following in John, Jonathan's footsteps on, on the design fictional uh, uh, trajectory, thinking about um, uh, uh, a LARP, a live action role playing game, um, you know, that sort of uh, takes us its point of a departure this conversation. And, um, and I was trying to sort of toy with projecting people imaginatively and behaviorally into a space that was that was post policing and like, how do we even get there? And so the premise of this game is that the American Truth and Reconciliation Commissions on policing have just finished, right? Um, so 
again, like as as Jonathan did, and as as you know, design and visionary fiction sort of uh, holds out to us. You know, we use enough of the furniture of reality that's familiar, right? An allusion to truth and reconciliation. Well, we know that that's a real thing. We know that that's a thing that really happened in a place. So we know that it's possible. Uh, we don't know all of what it did uh, or what, all of what it's left behind, but like it's, it has a plausibility. And so attaching this, this, this sort of plausibility to a very, what today seems like a fanciful projection, um, you know, invites us and invites others into a space where at least we can start to even play at behaving as if. Um, and I think, you know, the conversations that become possible and perhaps only possible if we can bring people into spaces like that is part of, part of what's worth, you know, not just, you know, creating more lime coats like fictions, but actually building on these kinds of fictions. Mm -hmm. There's a thing I really want to underline there because I love that a lot. And part of what I love about it is um, a few years ago, I, I went through a little phase of being fascinated by truth and reconciliation processes and, and doing some homework. And of course, I started out with this very romantic view of um, what truth and reconciliation processes had achieved. And once one digs, the dismal truth is kind of dismal. Um, that, wow, the, that process is really interesting and does achieve some things, but it, it kind of does not achieve what the romantic image sort of makes you want to hope for. But the, I think that um, that tension and frustration is actually a fruitful place to do that kind of imagining exercise, right? Of, of starting from a thing that is plausible and connects to something in the world and that has problems. So it's not a utopian fiction. It's, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, a, it's a grubby, frustrating fiction in the way that it would need to be in order for it to really be useful even though part of what we're doing is sort of like breaking out and expanding the imaginal space, which people can conceive. Yep, 100%. So y'all see that I've been annotating and linking while you're talking and weaving a bunch of other stuff in, uh, some of which we can go back to, but, but it's- <clears throat> I have one little other thing stuck in my brain. Good. I kind of want to surface because we, we could talk about uh, lime coat ethos. Yeah. Um, which is strangely, I, I find myself thinking about Superman. Um, and Superman um, is like, there's scholarship about like what makes a good Superman story. And, and one of the core ideas is Superman wants to save everybody. And even Superman can't do it. And um, there's a school of thought which says the best Superman stories are ones in which the focus is that the person Superman is trying to save is the villain, right? Because Superman wants to save everybody. Mm -hmm. And the inherent challenge of that and the way in which, you know, he is a fantastical figure um, makes that challenge approachable Right, because Superman is also, you know, he's a, he's a bodhisattva, right? He's he's liberated from fear and attachment because um, he has very little to fear. He's invulnerable. Right, he's invulnerable, and so he can enter into danger with fearlessness. And um, the conceit of Superman, the the hopeful thing, is well, then if you were in fact equipped with that invulnerability, you too would be liberated to be altruistic and good and dedicate those energies to supporting other people. And, and I, I think that that is connected to the ethos of danger and uh, fearlessly facing it that is part of um, like what we're talking about with a kind of a line code ethos, which contrasts with you know, the, the warrior cop business um, in which you have these agents of the state who are armed and fearful and empowered to react violently in fear. Um, so I, I have a long running, I'm sorry, I'm sort of like holding the floor just another minute. I have a long running Twitter thread about 
bad policing. Um, and um, and uh, and I say the same thing in each tweet where I share a bad story, and and it ends with um, the legitimacy of liberal democracy is at stake. Because from like a Hobbes Leviathan standpoint, right, the purpose of the state is to be the only legitimate actor to use force, thereby settling the tendency for other questions to be resolved through force. No one else is allowed to use force. And that is made morally legitimate by the state which has that capacity for force being bound by laws and rights and limitations and democratic accountability. And the, the worm at the heart of American policing now is that uh, police are not democratically accountable. In fact, they're the opposite of that, right? They are this uh, rogue force which cannot be reined in by democratic processes. They are not accountable. They are less accountable than ordinary citizens are, rather than more accountable, which is what they should be, as part of the compact of their professionalism. Which again is part of why like I'm an abolitionist and like I, we have to sever the relationship with that legacy. You have to not call it policing. Um, but that whether you're that kind of radical or not, the fundamental principle remains the same, right? Whatever interventions you do, and that applies to line coats who do not have violence in their toolkit, um, is they have to be um, you know, accountable in a profound sense for their action and, um, and inherit the liberal conception of you know, universalist obligation, right? Like Superman, they have to try to save everybody. Yeah, uh, uh, love all of that. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that I want to sort of build on there is, um, you know, um, I think the, the uh, uh, things, one of the things we have to reckon with, which is, you know, certainly far from complicated, is the connection of policing uh, and the legitimacy of law. The, the legitimacy of political authority, um, you know, the Hobbesian, you know, reference uh, dear to my heart because Leviathan is like for me one of one of the most important of of our historical texts in the Western tradition around around these things, and and of course, you know, um, you know, th th there are two really powerful things in Hobbes, um, you know, uh, which 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 are important to sort of recollect, and and Jonathan, you know, has has pulled on the thread of one, which is you know, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the idea that, um, that uh, words without the sword um, have no strength to, to bind us to our contracts. That's, you know, that's the idea. Um, and so this, this, um, this uh, rationalized authority um, is meant to, to wield this, this threatened power, right? Uh, to compel. It's meant to be our power, right? Um, because the sovereign is meant not to be the individual who wears the crown, uh, but the person empowered by the system of authority, right? Um, and lots of that, uh, you know, is broken down and lots of it is corrupted, um, you know, in our dealing with it. Um, and, and one of the things that came to mind, you know, Jonathan, when you were talking about all of that is one of the big things that's crept into police ethos, um, you know, is, is another piece of, uh, of law and common law, um, you know, which has come to be expressed, uh, you know, in, in our uh, law, laws of self-defense, um, na namely the st stand your ground principle, right? Um, and I think this is, you know, both where a lot of state sanctioned in the police context, but also non-state sanctioned violence occurs and is anchored around, right? This idea of, hey, I don't have to move. Um, you know, I have a right to stand where I am. And, and you know, we, we raise that to the level of, of a metaphorical, right? I mean, not just the physical ground on which I stand on, but my immovable uh, right to my immovable ideas, um, you know. Uh, well, and in, in fact, it's, it's not just to, to be immovable, but the, the right to escalate. 
Right. Yeah. 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 No. Well said. Um, but but I mean I I I I think that there is something really important uh, to dig on there, right? Because yeah. um, what's bound up um, in stand your ground um, is uh, is our um, our ideas about property um, and about what we have a right to defend and and to your point uh, rightly um, what we're what we're entitled to escalate should we feel sufficiently that our property however you know con constructed here um you know we have have the right to defend even unto the death um and and you know historically we have evolved in law these these you know very weak subjective tests which again you know we alluded to in in the um and you know you alluded to jerry when you were talking about the whole um, bulletproof, um, uh, you know, Warrior. policing concept, right? Is is that the only way to eliminate threat in a absolute terms is to literally, you know, obliterate the threat. Um, and should you feel sufficiently threatened, you apparently ought to be authorized to do that. Um, you know, um, but you know, I think what what, what was really important. To, to, to sort of, you know, that we're getting to, right, is like, these are a lot of big, you know, important furniture in our brain ideas mm -hmm. that we are all deeply attached to, right? Uh, our sense of our own personal rights and our own personal integrity. And so, you know, like the lot, what I'm saying is that the logic, uh, you know, that one has to let go of to even start to have certain kinds of conversations is considerable. Um, you know, a lot of deconstruction and, and a couple things. And, and we're sort of asking people to hit undo on a whole series of things that are buried really quite deep inside of our institutions, norms, assumptions, mm -hmm. et cetera, that are mutually reinforcing and kind of layered in pretty thick now. And part of the reason for the frustration of activists trying to actually change policing or actually get rid of racism is that these systems actually need to be dismantled, shifted around. And in the process, people's minds have to shift so that the new system actually like fits better. And then they'll be like, oh, okay, I see that that that, that works. And this is long, slow kind of change. It's the, it's the long arc of history, unfortunately. I have to point out, I, I, I was gonna go like 90 minutes, but I, somebody, um, booked me for the top of the hour on a call that's really important. That's right. We have a hard right. stop at the top of the hour, right. but I'm happy to hit resume if you all want to later. So, you know, let, let's let's uh, debrief uh, on email or wherever, but then happy to pick this up again. Yeah, I would be happy yeah. to do that. Yeah, and I, I, I just want to chime in on on something I saw there, um, uh, the, the hashtag pledge to listen. You know, I, I, I think, um, you know, one. I know that one of the things uh, that that I thought, uh, you know, many more times than once in seeing the, the Me Too hashtag, um, you know, was uh, was a hashtag. Uh, uh, I hear you, mm -hmm. um, right? Um, because um, there has not been, uh, we have not con constructed an answer to Me Too um that i mean but believe all women is is you know uh um perhaps uh, uh you know an example but it, to me sort of insufficiently puts puts an individual on the line for you know um uh sort of acknowledging an accountability mm -hmm. um and um and again thinking about the ways in which um you know we can uh um sort of build build a culture um of listening um you know certainly um you know listen before you answer um which you know has become like a very antique notion um you know and too many of our quote unquote listening fora uh you know i think this is like the 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 thing that is so horrendously bad about clubhouse um, uh, is that things that are called conversations, mm -hmm. right, are in, are in fact the worst kind of podia uh, from which people, uh, you know, sort of command others uh, to listen uh, because they have no choice in, in, in the very architecture. Um, so I coined the, the app. 
I coined the term duologue, two concurrent <laughs> monologues, two people talking there you past go. each other. There you go. Um, but again, you know, I mean, I, I, in that, you know, um, like as we learn over and over again in too many contexts, especially those in which people are talking past each other and no one's hearing each other, people have a deep need to be heard and people feel deeply unheard all the time. And we can think what we want about whether people ought to or not feel unheard, but that is a subjective feeling and to deny it, whatever its content is dangerous <laughs> um, because we don't pay attention to reality when we make those denials. And that may feel morally satisfying, but uh, I don't think it leads us uh, to good places. Uh, I don't think it leads us to what we want. Um, so so, so let, me, let me ask a couple of questions that I haven't thrown in the pot yet, just as, as fodder for thinking, which is, <clears throat> um, do Lyme, are Lyme coats a previously recruited body of humans who then travel to emergencies and drop in like smoke jumpers? Mm. Or is Lyme coating a role anybody in a situation on the ground can pick up and say, uh, oh, uh, I'm calling myself a Lyme coat. And that means I've just learned up on uh, being an enlightened witness and peel principles and a bunch of other stuff. And I'm taking advantage of these free and open source kits of resources and other kinds of stuff that I can get down. And I understand that if I run into a situation, I need to do these sorts of things. But, but basically on the job training with coaches and support from other Lyme coats who've been through it before, who are available in real time on Discord fricking servers or whatever. But you know, like what we're doing these days is, is like that, that's kind of how communities help each other, right? Uh, support forums on Discord or whatever. Uh, and community building but but then but then this if this is a contagious idea then lime coats show up all over the place pre-trained and when an emergency happens it's like okay are there any lime coats in the room and the four people that bought the the yellow cap the baseball cap that that the high vis yellow baseball cap put it on and say yes i am yeah you know here here well, i have like, a point of view around a, this but oh I, good Michael, you go first yeah, yeah, and and we'll we'll have to uh, for for your sake, Jerry, uh, take use this to take in for landing. I love this idea. There's there's certainly way way more to talk about, um, but here's what I love about the idea of of um, uh, um, you know the, the scenario that you describe. You know there are all kinds of situations of which you both have probably seen very many in Portland over the last couple of years, in which it would be very powerful to see a very visible, very numerous force enter the, the fray and visibly in effect say, no violence will happen here today because we are here to see it uh, and we will prevent it one way or another. Like that, that's an incredibly hopeful idea at, at any rate. Well, there is in fact an organization <laughs> which wears high-vis lime baseball caps, which does exactly that thing. The National Lawyers Guild. Ah. The National Lawyers Guild? Yes. Wow. I think that's the right name for them. Um, they are huh. uh, lawyers who go to um, street activist events mostly. No kidding. Um, wearing high-vis uh, t-shirts and baseball caps and are like, hey, if somebody needs a lawyer, yep. uh, if something goes wrong, yep. we are I'm over right here. here. And I'm we are here. witnessing what is happening and we are aware of the legal implications. I'm, so that, that's actually a thing that exists. Huh. <laughs> actually, yeah. one of the, yeah, one of the, one of the tragic bellwethers actually here in Portland, um, having been at uh, street events with the NLG, showing up is in recent years, they've been wearing helmets instead of baseball caps um, because they were genuinely afraid of getting shot. The situations were, were too dangerous. Yeah. That's fascinating, thank you. Um, wow. Yeah. It's completely uh, cool. So, I, so I've added all those to role models. I've got a bunch now of role models for Lyme coats from the white helmets we talked about over dinner 
to this millions of conversations idea that led to the pledge to listen thing to a bunch of others. So they're in here and I just pasted into our chat the link to this this node you right here something. in my Thank brain. You, so you can play with it and we can keep talking. Um, Great. Any other thoughts right now? No, just so, thank you, thank you for the time and yeah. uh, and the conversation, both of you. But uh, um, and thanks for the offer to pick it up again. Um, let's let's let Jonathan and I debrief some and uh, and and hit you back. Okay. I love that. Thank you both. That was like really fun. Yeah. Yeah. Fun. Have a great more, day. More soon. Bye. Yep.